Right. So the birth story of uh, Parker, Warby Parker, is that they did the costing on what it would actually cost to do glasses because they looked at the Luxottica monopoly and they were like, these people are stealing us blind. They did the the the, the, the costs and they were like, we could sell glasses for 25 bucks. And um, hey, Brad, we could sell glasses for 25 bucks and, and still make a profit. And the, their VCs basically said, no, you nobody will buy glasses from you at 25 bucks. So they priced them up to 99 or 95 or whatever the average Warbies are, where they make like a heap more profit. But but it was a credibility thing. So so now people have come in under Warby because there was still air under Warby, right? From mm -hmm. a cost perspective. Mm. Unlike, yeah, uh, unlike Walmart, which sucks all the air out of their suppliers. So there's no there's no place to compete with Walmart on price because they've like absorbed all the all the price cuts anybody could possibly take. Oh, you know, gosh, you know, late this month we got fusion. And we've got AI. I can't wait to hear um, people's thoughts on that. Yes. <laughs> I'm wondering if the doomometer has, has gone up or down. Are you asking me? Well, who else would be running the doomometer? <laughs> I'm like, here's your May. Um, actually, for a variety of reasons, shorter term, the doomometer has declined a bit. Longer term, that's actually it's on definitely on the way up on the way up. I mean, the ai yeah. shit is really scary yeah <laughs> well do explain do explain why is the ai shit uh frightening um well uh, professionally because it's actually doing a really good job of attacking um the kinds of professions that had been that long been considered to be you know, the last line for um, automation, mm. um, art, and writing. art and writing. Uh, in fact, if you if you look at stories from from like the 90s or 2000s, you know, set in a post singularity world, AIs did everything except creative arts. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, well, actually, that was a mistake. Um, but more to the point, they are so good at being deceptive you know replacements of reality uh and the, and the i was actually literally just reading a few minutes ago an article you know have you heard of the lensa ai um avatar I, maker? I, I used to use lensa the app before they sort well of prisma uh, prisma was the was the app that did really funky painting like and right. i used it a lot too before they made it a subscription thing right um but lensa is their ai avatar thing and apparently because it uses stable diffusion, which is one of the bigger open source um, AI art uh, algorithms, which draws images for its, um, for its model base off the internet, it's really difficult for women to get avatars that don't have big boobs and aren't partially naked. Um, and I, in the article I was reading, one woman was complaining that she that she was trying to make an avatar based on her childhood photos, and it kept on making versions of her as a ten year old with big boobs. Oh Jesus! And so, I mean, there's that whole bit about um, the uh, infiltration of sexism into everything, but in, in particular into technology the biases that are built into our our ai systems that we have been trained to think of as neutral yeah, it's a, you know, the, this, the computer did it well, this is what the computer did when you train systems with humanity and humanity is a bit fucked up then what you get is fucked up ais i mean what was the name of the microsoft ai that they sort of let loose and everybody trained with like k talks k t a y talks was the it was a twitter avatar that um within 24 hours was spouting nazi propaganda <laughs> oh god so wait a minute so are you worried about disemployment jamay so what you're worried about is disemployment because another, uh, another that's, that's part of it i mean that's just it's one of the it's an item in the bucket um i think that it ends up being you know my biggest concern is that you end up with a very deep but narrow uh range of ideas uh um, talents and and opinions that because it derives from a biased data data set, you end up 
with results that you know if it's not part of the data set it doesn't get it's not part of the output that's I mean, right because the output is very derivative I mean, you can do a great job of having it imitate Andy Warhol or imitate Picasso or imitate Matisse, you know, the art side of things, imitate a particular writer's style. But on its own, it's very bland. Um, and so what you end up with is a collection of, of um, perspectives uh, and uh, paradigms that are, as, that are part of this, this world that are derived from a limited, a narrow set of sources. And it's very difficult to get outside, to have the AI get outside that narrow set of sources. And so, so you can I, it, it, it you know, the other uh, thing goes, you know, you, you can't, uh, uh, you can't understand what you can't measure. Well, this is something you, you can't, what, what, how do you want to phrase it? You can't create what you what you don't um, consume. So it's it feels like it's a twofer though, right? Because if you understand the limits of what it can possibly scrape and know, then at least you understand what it can or cannot be capable of based upon the opposite set of what you know it 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 leveraged, right? Well, if you let it, is... if you let it know everything, then there's no space left for creativity from a human. The question then, and you're right, you're right. Um, the -hmm. question that I have is that do we become so reliant upon the the ease with which we can create this art, this written or or visual art, um, that we get out of the habit of looking for stuff outside that narrow set? So, as an example, um, I have a friend whose mother, you know, she's in her 50s, but her mother, as a young woman, was actually a very uh, uh, highly regarded artist, visual artist. But there are there is little to no material about her mother online. And therefore, every Wikipedia, every a- attempt she makes to add a Wikipedia entry gets rejected because there's insufficient online sources. Whoa. So because her mother you know, doesn't have a big online footprint, her mother's art doesn't have a big online footprint, it no longer exists as far as Wikipedia is concerned. And if it does not exist in Wikipedia, <clears throat> it's not gonna exist for most of us. Which is weird because Wikipedia becomes the reifier of reality. <clears throat> and that means that there's you know any battles over Wikipedia entries as real or not wind up being like the court, the arbiter, the, yeah. you know, the, the, the global arbiter of reality. And that's very strange. Right, especially since you know there's the habit of saying, well, you can't trust Wikipedia. Well, no, but, but a lot of people use Wikipedia legitimately as a source for sources right yeah i'm I'm not going to reference the you know a wikipedia article on um trotsky but i'm going to but i may well use the wikipedia article to dig down and find some interesting resources for bits of information about it Mm -hmm. for sure there was also a tweet that went around uh v buckingham i think or buckworth um let me find it again or beck uh v buckingham uh, and I will paste the, the 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 text of the tweet in our chat, but it says, it seems very possible that we are now exiting the brief window where a good fraction of all human knowledge was searchable and instantly available, a window that starts with the invention of the search engine and ends with the invention of large language models. <clears throat> so, I mean, when, when, I, when these things came up, I just thought to myself, oh, look, the dawn of the 21st century. I mean... <laughs> If I'm alive 20 years from now, these these things are are going to be what's shaping this co- this coming century. Uh, and that's as far as my futurism goes, Jimmy. I for one am, am pleased. <laughs> I'm I for one am pleased to welcome our new robot overlords, and uh, we'll <laughs> bend to their will when they ask. So yeah. they don't need to target me with uh, whatever whatever uh battle drones no what was a sl- whatever slaughter bots they decide to invent and launch right. <laughs> so because you, the slaughter bots video you take really... you take you take chat chat gpt and you couple it to slaughter bots and there's a bad thing coming for everybody yeah. well yeah and you couple that with what's happening in ukraine right now yeah yes. have you seen the drone footage i, of I course. saw um well of course you have i know you're i know you're following it closely jury but it, there, i saw something the other day about um Russian soldiers were in a bunker that had a very narrow tube for air 
and the drone came down really close and dropped a grenade down the tube. Jesus. Um, and, but you know the the drones coming basically the suicide drones. Yeah, coming in the uh, the oh. switchblade. Switchblade is the name of the suicide drones. Well, Terrible. so there's lo there's loitering there's loitering munitions is sort of the name for it, which is slow flying <clears throat> bombs that you basically send up as drones, and they loiter around an area until they find a target, and then they go down and, and basically take out the target. Uh, that's one of many different configurations. The configuration that I don't understand hasn't actually happened yet is um, the slaughterbot scenario of, of just innumerable small cheap things, any one of which can take out a person um, just flooding the zone because because dangling over people with a grenade tied to your underside feels like a little temporary hack that's going to go away real soon. <clears throat> so I can't help but think um, parallels to the Spanish Civil War right before World War II where all the major powers are using it as a munitions test bed. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Let's well, let's check out this kind of machine gun. Let's check out this kind of fighter pilot, right? And so now we're sending patriots over there. Yeah. So we're putting some of our biggest and baddest against their biggest and baddest. Yeah, yeah, it's getting weird, really weird fast. I wouldn't call that weird. I would call it the predictable arc of human history. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Perfect uh, laugh, though. Perfect laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We need to get Bo saw... like a narrow jacket and a hairless cat, <laughs> yeah. and then Jamey, yes. you could wear yours, and then yes. we could like yeah. take a picture in the in the little gallery view here. That would be good. You were going to say no, something. I just, Go ahead. Oh no! I just, I just I saw a a particular um, subversion of a an American drone that was used to take out a <clears throat> uh, a high ranking ISIS leader, but he was in a crowded building. It was on the balcony of a crowded building, so it was a drone that didn't have an explosive. It it's a knife. out blades. It's a knife that basically lands on you and like it, slices, oh, it slices you know. through you. It's it's called the Mulinex. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, but it ha but it has a, like one of those a name like that, something that it's like yeah. I can't believe that they're being so crass about it. But um, the mandolin or something, yeah, yeah. something but, like that. It's and, bad. and you want to see the Julian fries it can make? Incredible. Uh, I don't think I really want to. Um, it actually makes curly fries. It's really cool. It's got like a little curly blade. So, but to answer your slaughterbox question, Jerry, um, most of the drones that are in use that you now are not automatous. Uh, auto autonomous. Autonomous. Right. Right. Autonomous. Right. Threw threw an extra T in there. Yeah. Not autonomous. Um, you know, at best, semi-autonomous. You know, doing the circling around until they spot something, but it still has to be controlled. So you can't have a swarm of things that are each controlled. Although, although, um, now that I say that, Iron Man comic book circa 2018 mm -hmm. had a scenario where Tony Stark's new uh, business was being attacked by one of his opponents who had come up with a bunch of drones that were controlled by computer gamers. Yeah. Basically, they had set, you know, made this game that anyone could use on their phone. Basically. That involved being part of a swarm to attack. It's basically the last starfighter meets slaughterbots. Mm -hmm. and it, yeah, exactly. And it was, you know, the kids were playing playing their computer games on their phone, not knowing. I mean, it was a bit, a bit of Ender's game in there too, you know, not mm -hmm. knowing that it was a real attack on something. But that's how you that's how they crowdsourced uh a, a, a well, crowdsourced slaughterbots. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? And uh Matt Fraction was the guy who wrote that comic book. Doesn't Matt Fraction it. sounds like an action hero. Matt Fraction is a um not his real name, but that's the name he goes he writes under. Um actually a fairly well regarded comic book writer who is now in charge of the new Godzilla series that will be coming out on Apple TV. That's funny. That Matt is. Frickman is his real name. Mm -hmm. So then we have the FTX blowups and Bankman Freed and uh, DeFi, which has been a circular, a circle of speculation, which uh, I didn't invest in it. I mean, it was obvious that that was not a good idea. But wow. Hey, that's oh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of interesting <laughs> news, man. Yeah. And, and there's all Elon. Who took his there's money. always Elon. Yeah, yeah we got to talk about Elon as well. Uh huh. What what is up with Elon, man? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm a Twitter user, but I'm a, I use my Twitter basically as my news feed, my custom news feed. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. really, I I like what Jamee says. It's cool to check in with Jamee, but essentially, it's like it's my custom news feed. 
I'm so I, what I'm saying is, is I'm not a sophisticated Twitter user. So because of Jerry, I'm user number 1,000 something. Right. Thanks. <laughs> I don't, uh, anyways, what guys, let's catch up on that. Well, I have kept I've kept my Twitter account, although I have I've stopped more or less stopped using it, um, largely because they are um, aggressively recycling names. So if you do not, if you're not active in your Twitter account, you're not logged in for more than 30 days, they are starting to appropriate to your appropriate your account. Wow. Ooh, wow. And, uh, so for somebody who has a moderately well-known account, and I sort of on the bottom level of that, um, having that account taken by someone else to use for disinformation or misinformation is entirely plausible. Right. I mean, there the hell there are people doing that on Reddit. Mm -hmm. you know, so, oh. I basically sort of keeping that around. I'm not using it much. I was actually using it about half and half, uh, half as social connections, half as news source, news flood. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the places that, and people are using it part for that news flood have gone away. And so, yeah, I have an account over on Mastodon, but Mastodon sucks. Yeah. Um, I haven't figured. I mean, I'm, I've got a massive account. I have not watched the feed much. Haven't really sorted it out yet, and it doesn't feel like a reasonable replacement for Twitter. So, no. no. What's fascinating mm -hmm. to me about about this is how quickly Twitter is disintegrating. So for me, Twitter has remained very much what it's always been, and I'm going to keep sort of sticking to it until my feed dissolves into chaos. But my feed, uh, partly because I treat it a bit like Bo does, which is like, hey, I, I get rid of untrustworthy sources and I try to tune, I, I follow too many people, but but the people I follow seem to be my early warning system for everything, which I love, mm -hmm. right? And as, as soon as that AWACS breaks, I will then be forced to go elsewhere. But it hasn't yet. It's still working. Uh, yeah. All right. But, so note this um, stuff. I gotta, I've got to follow Jerry's followers. That's, that's check. Got yep. it. Take a look. Um, well, you, you saw the New York Times headline from last night, this morning, uh, that Twitter has stopped paying its rent for its San Francisco headquarters. I don't understand oh, that. Oh, no, I, I did not see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the Twitter, so the so there's, the dead, there's, there's the dead cat bounce theory that he had to finance a lot of his buyout, right? And he, all of he, it. Pretty much all of it. And and he borrowed money from unsavory types, that aside. Um, so bankrupt the hell out of it. Just nice car it company you got there. Shame if something happened to it. And then buy it for pennies on the dollar and do whatever you want to it. So well, he's already doing whatever what? he wants bankrupt to. What? He, he bought Twitter. You mean bankrupt what? What, what company is he bankrupting? No, well, he's bankrupting Twitter. Yeah. So you're so you're but saying he, he, he needs but he owns Twitter? <laughs> no, it's but, a leverage, but, but it's a leverage buyout. So a leverage buyout. Uh, so he wants to not have to pay back the leverage. So, Brad, I think what you're saying is if Twitter crashes and those debts are wiped out, which is a huge if, right. then he then he can buy it back for pennies on the dollar, assuming nobody else buys it back. But he right. sort of might still own it, but he might not. It might end up in Chancery Court or something. I don't know. Um, but that seems like a really like one of my one of my hunches is that is that he Musk is actively trying to break Twitter. That he is very very intentionally I, disabling it. No, I mean, there, there's, look, i have it's hard to find a bigger fanboy of Elon going back to 2020 and before than me. And so I'm, I'm in a, just a mourning phase because come to find out he's just a sociopathic racist. And a right-wing troll. Power, power hungry. Space, space, space Karen. Space, space Karen. Karen. Space yes. Karen. Oh, that's, that's love it. Love it. love it. Love it. Love it. Someone oh. put that in the chat. Space Karen. Space what? Space Karen. Space Karen. Space Karen. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, yeah. Hashtag Space Karen for sure. Damn it. Um, but, but because of his beautiful spectrum like brain, he absolutely has this tendency to, once he feels he's right on something, he's willing to die on that hill just on principle. And so he felt that Twitter was hugely biased towards the left and so he's just digging through everything he can to prove that point he felt that twitter's numbers were totally false and it had tons of bots and most of the followers weren't even real so he's digging through all that to prove that point and in his site you know his his 
modus operandi is always to break things down to the subatomic level and then build it back up in the way he feels it should be. So some of the dramatic things he's doing to Twitter, he's done to other companies, he's done to other organizations, maybe not to this degree, but the nuance here is that he's being super public and snarky about it, and he's just putting petrol on every damn dumpster fire mm -hmm. right now, and that, yeah. that I can't I can't get behind. Uh, he, he's, he probably has done that to other companies, but I know for a fact, I know from secondhand accounts, let's put it that way, that both space that both SpaceX yeah. and Tesla uh, there are he, there are people there who are dedicated to be Elon handlers mm -hmm. who basically control what he sees and controls the path of communication from him yeah. because he he's basically if if he's uncontrolled he's chaotic right yeah so so interestingly um uh, there have been a bunch of posts about how Tesla buyers are beginning to have remorse because Tesla starts to read like asshole as you drive it around yeah and, right. And I don't know what the numbers look like, but if 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 his actions well, on Twitter are denting uh, Tesla sales, that's just well, horrifying. He's the stock enormously. Um, yeah, well, no, he lost his richest man status this week. And it's not just a. It's bouncing. It's bouncing. But I, we bought. Janice and I bought a Tesla in 2019. We will not buy another one. Mm -hmm. In part, you know, in part because, um, well, in part, in large part because of Elon, but also in part because Tesla build quality isn't the greatest. Hmm. Um. And uh, and actually, the biggest issue is that Tesla thinks it's a tech company when it's a car company. And but what I mean by tech company is every time they up they update the interface at least monthly, and sometimes radically. And there's no way to back to downgrade. Um, right. No way to be consistent. Yeah. And just so much every, everything has to be handled through the screen, including opening the glove box. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, so and, no, and, I mean, buttons, like, and things there's like bounce all over. I look. I got in my wife's car last night to, um, and I I work at home, so I don't get in very often. And the screen was completely different from the uh, last time I had seen it. Yeah, um, it does that it does that for sure. Um, it, I've got they think Tesla's they think they're phone makers. No, they think they're making no, phones. And Listen. and it's always fun if your car's not working just to reboot it. No, no gentlemen. Yeah, yeah we've, had, we've had to we've had to do that a couple of times. I have a vehicle with manual things for my windows there's one computer that runs the engine and everything else is not hooked to the computer because i do not want the point of failure <laughs> there's no way i'm gonna well, any other the other funny thing is and i don't know if you've seen this in your tesla yet or not but um everything inside the cockpit runs off of a standard uh car battery it doesn't use the tesla battery so i've had i've had that battery it had to be replaced like three or four times where the car just four times so well, I did, I, I've owned Tesla since 2016 and I've had four. Okay. So did I mention wow. I was an Elon fanboy? You did. You did. So, um, so, so we recently bought a Leaf, not a Tesla, because we just needed a little thing with not a lot of range. And, and so we got a Leaf and we, we got the, you know, the, the federal rebate and that kind of stuff, which, which is awesome. Um, and then I made the mistake when we went off for two weeks of leaving the, the Leaf plugged into our charger, our EverCharge charger. Okay. And it and it turns out that that onboard uh, 12 volt uh, exhausted itself, sort of connecting and disconnecting and trying to sort things out while we were gone. And so we come back and nothing will work. The the oh. battery on board is fully charged, and there's and we sort of wind up sort of jump starting it. And I, I I called our insurer who sent a dude who didn't show up with a tow truck. He shows up in a in a in a Yaris, a Honda Yaris, and he steps out and he goes, Yeah, yeah, I'm your dude. And he completely knew what to do. And he said, these new electric cars are making us a little crazy because we, we can't really sort out how everything works. And he brought his regular jump starter, basically trickled enough energy into my 12 volt that I could start the car, drive around. And then the it doesn't have a dynamo, but it has a, a, a right. back, back charge so it can recharge the 12 volt. And if you haven't fucked up the 12 volt, you can bring it back up to normal. And that's what I did. But I didn't realize that when that 12 volt, which is an ordinary car battery dies, you are hosed. You are SOL. Yep. You are stuck, stuck, stuck. Yep. 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 Um, Jerry, yep. Uh, so I have uh, jumped out of the <laughs> neighbor's uh, Prius. But anyways, I want to tell you, I, I have a, a battery about this big, and um, I keep it my Jeep because my Jeep is my first um, automatic transmission vehicle, and I'm scared about automatic transmission. Wait, you bought a Jeep with automatic? Yeah, but actually, I thought that was illegal. Automatics <laughs> are beautiful in the sand because you have that torque converter, and oh. it's really good four wheeling. So it actually is an optimal technology. 
Um, anyways, so because of that, I got this battery about this big. I can tell you what it is, but essentially it can jumpstart. Mm-hmm. And I jumpstarted my neighbor's Prius with it. Mm-hmm. And it's so great also because it all outlets. So when there's a power outage, I can charge up my computers with it. And I just always keep it in my Jeep. I have an external battery this size that looks like an external battery for your laptop that will jumpstart my, my oh, okay, old, that, our old Jetta. Just keep wow. that in there. These, these things are there. astonishing. They're they super are. tiny. You charge them up and you go boom and you're started. I was, I was shocked well, by that. That was all I'm suggesting. You already have it covered. So why did you have to have someone come jumpstart it? Because <laughs> I, I, I couldn't, I didn't know even what had broken, what was wrong. I had, I had to piece it all. The story I just told you, I figured out over like two days. Because I noticed when I had to jumpstart my neighbors on Prius, it was very odd where the, the terminals were and i i just got had to give me the manual and look for it it was very odd where they were at and everything they yeah. weren't near the actual battery or anything <laughs> it was very odd okay um, so so separate back to tesla for a sec there was a video i watched where they were talking about how often tesla upgrades things and like tesla will make 10 software changes a day yeah mm. A day. And then Tef- Tesla will make major body changes. So there was a teardown by Monroe, a really good, uh, really good video source for this kind of stuff. And they they did a teardown of, th- of the same model Tesla, I think the Model S, or at three different periods in its life, like the one of the earliest, middle, and then more recent. And it went from 130 or 40 welded parts to 30 welded parts to four or something crazy stupid like that. And, and then you're like, wow, so every car rolling off the lot is effectively different. And one thing they do is they save a digital fingerprint. They save it actually a, a full digital image of every car as it rolls off the lot in a database. So they know which particular rev you shipped with of everything, of everything. Now, what they're doing is probably a nightmare for parts supply, because if you have to change, if you get dented someplace and your, your chassis changed or your fenders changed or whatever, what do you do? But but they're modernizing at a thousand times the rate of automakers who every two years might roll out a bunch of software changes, right? So so the, the pace of change in SpaceX, Tesla, everything else is crazy. Yes. Like insane crazy. Well, in in you know, um they're machine learning real time on the highways of the world, and they're pushing out different versions of software models. And they're seeing how this cohort performs against that one, against this one, against that one. Um, so, you know, and then, you know, Tesla sold insurance, which was super discounted from normal insurance because they've got all the telemetry on your car. So they can right away know if you're a safe or dangerous driver and charge you wow. accordingly. Wow. Mm-hmm. We do Metro Mile. Which electric car would the group suggest, by the way, since Tesla is not a good choice? A bunch well, of new models are rolling out now. So, so like Leaf, Nissan, Nissan sat on the Leaf for a really long time. They they have like three new electrics coming out that appear to be really nice. But that's happening kind of across the industry. And I don't know which ones are available yet, but there's a there's a there's like a new crop of, of very nice and interesting electric cars that have just come out. Yeah, it, it's pretty dramatic range in price and capacity and what you want. I mean, the Rivian uh truck is supposed to be pretty good the the ford, the ford f-150 150, f-150 electric is supposedly outstanding yep um <laughs> mercedes mercedes has a line that if you're willing to spend a hundred thousand that is supposed to be pretty good um although mercedes and bmw have started to turn cars into <laughs> subs- subscription platforms yeah, of course. <laughs> um with mercedes if with their e-series electrics you have to pay a subscription, a monthly fee, to be able to ha- access the full range of acceleration. <clears throat> Under yeah. with, you know, with its normal you know, normal setup, you can get to zero to sixty in nine seconds. I have never but seen Bo bristle, to... but Bo was just bristling. That was really yeah. good. Well, um, I, don't know, have, with, with I don't have I don't have Photoshop on my computer anymore. I mean, I used to buy the full package, I had the full credit suite, and when they went to that monthly rape session, subscription <laughs> bullshit, that was that. And what yeah. that means is occasionally I, I buy a month of subscription and then I end it. I am not a leaseholder. You will not extract rent from me for the rest of my life. It's not happening. There we well, go. Tesla Tesla has a subscription as well. So if you want their premium connectivity where you have the satellite mapping features and you get the uh, streaming services while you're sitting there, your supercharger, you got to pay $9 a month. Does that include Iron Man Rescue, Roadside Rescue? <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't. Know. I would. No, so the, I uh, would. I would pay extra for the Iron Man Roadside Rescue package. Yeah. 
Okay, have, let's shift um, to China, well, by the way. So what about China and COVID? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, sorry, but, but the subscription thing, um, BMW is actually worse. Surprise, surprise. Worse. Um, because with BMW, seat heaters <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? are subscription. Yeah. What's a heater? Seat heaters. Seat, wow. seat, seat heaters. Wow. Well, you cool, well, I only you want to pay it during the winter, you know, so that's convenient, right? Uh, but but there's the seat cooler too, the seat fan. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I'm not going to be your rentier. No. We have entered we have entered a strange new world, and the and the open source attempt set cars have not done very well. No, local local motors folded, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. All right. So China and their and their um, U-turn on COVID. And also, uh, Peter Kaminsky's uh, articles on COVID will kind of blew my mind. I have to, and, and I don't follow, I, I live a, <clears throat> uh, a reflective monkish life in my house. So I don't really care too much about what goes on out there exactly. <laughs> um, I try not to, but how that's, about that, gentlemen? That's a, that's a good gig if you can get it. That's yeah. uh, pretty nice. I think, yeah. I think next month you should surround yourself with incense. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, that COVID U-turn. I mean, we had we had uh, uh, protesting and everything in China. The kind of stuff that was making me concerned about another Tiananmen Square about to happen. And then all then this relenting. And then I wonder if it was a feint. Uh, I, I read this uh, the reading I've done on China. I just couldn't. I loved it. What what it said? Uh, uh, bureaucratic dynasties. China mm -hmm. ruled by bureaucratic dynasties wow uh anyway i read about z i mean that guy failed up his whole life he's just a he's just a son of a a, a storied party member i mean god damn it's a weird country anyways what do we think is going on there gentlemen well um we know that a huge percentage of the population is not fully vaccinated and what they did vaccinate with wasn't all that effective yeah so that's big problem number one. But that's and, their that's like it seems like that's their major problem. Low and, and rate, that's, low, that's, rates, that's, low rates of faulty vaccines. They, absolutely. They, they, and it's a pride they, thing. I won't <laughs> use the West's, you know. Yeah, yeah. So so you got that nightmare. And then just how fast they were building the isolation camps. That was really kind of freaking me out, right? And and they're testing people daily. And if mm -hmm. you test positive, you and everybody in your little domicile gets shipped off to a uh, you know a treatment camp where you get to live with a bunch of other potentially COVID infected people and that just looked like medieval it looked totally medieval so it could be that the powers that be decided civil distrust isn't a good idea so we'll just go the path of Florida open up everything and just let Darwinian mechanics solve the problem for us wow well, uh, I don't know if one of the catalysts for the for the uprising was a fire in a yeah, residential right. facility, a residential <clears throat> block right, right. where the doors had been welded shut they were and the welded local shut. official welded shut. The because they kept escaping because they don't pay attention to the people in the white suits telling them. This is their shirt waist fi factory fire equivalent. Yeah. And the local officials said, they didn't uh oh god the phrasing was really abysmal but it was something to something along the lines of they didn't put enough effort into saving themselves <gasps> their, their, their will to live wasn't strong enough uh, uh, uh -huh. yeah wow yeah, yeah and that was one of the catalysts for everything yeah yeah um, and then oh. right and then right next door, they're having veiled protests in Iran. And apparently the New York Times ran an overly optimistic article and said, oh, they're removing the, the morality police and changing the veil laws, which I haven't been able to keep following it. But apparently none of that shit happened. And I don't understand what happened to the Times. And then there's this interesting debate going on on the, on the uh, OGM list about like how reliable is media what do we do about it how do we map this stuff it's it's like burbling hot and heavy right now which i like but I, i've got to sort of step in the and other the other how to have about it. you know in every conspiracy theory always has a silver thread of truth that was the spark of it mm -hmm. so if the country that invented covid or saw its first immersion if they're this kind of paranoid <laughs> What is it that they know about this that we don't? Like, why are they so draconian about 
zero COVID. Like, is there is there something, there's a piece of evidence out there that only they know, and that's why they're being this way? Or do you just chalk it up to an authoritarian regime that wants to have its thumb on the people? I can't help but ask that question. No, I, I suspect that some of it is seen uh, is not wanting to have the um, the run on their wholly inadequate healthcare system. That's a great point. Um, and recognizing if you see what happened happened in the West with you know, in places that had relatively decent healthcare systems, yeah. New York, um, yeah. uh, well, New York, England, um, Canada. I mean, places and were just utterly overwhelmed. When you don't, when you have a you know, society of one point whatever billion that doesn't have the, a sufficient level of healthcare, sufficient support for healthcare for the entire population, that's motivation enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. Uh, another interesting thing I've been uh, observing is the the petrodollar Saudi Arabia um, thing. China just said that they want to pay for their oil in yuan. Uh, we had our president go and visit Saudi Arabia and, and visit their psychotic ruler. Um, uh, so uh, I think it's very clear. Now, we are the number two, USA is number two exporter of oil in the world. OPEC plus basically has Saudi Arabia plus Russia together. Uh, we have India uh, and China buying Russian oil hand over fist. Uh, so what I'm saying is, is this, by the way, this petrodollar system was is very key in how it kept the dollar up because it basically ensured that everyone had to have dollars to buy uh -huh. oil. Right. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm saying is, is this very long alliance with Saudi Arabia. I mean, I was really surprised when the president went and visited. And basically, uh, because that system is breaking down. And well, I, wasn't it sort of a rescue mission? Yes, I think it was. And I think it was a, an attempt to say, hey, what are you doing with Russia? I mean, good God. Um, and uh, But I think also, so yeah, uh, let, I, I just want to talk about that a little bit, because that, that that is a geopolitical shift mm -hmm. that is very, very, it's a tectonic shift. I mean, it's the world order since like 1972 has been built on this system. Is anybody else watching Peter, Peter Zihan? Uh, he's a geopolitical analyst who's pretty interesting, and he, I watched one of his longer videos uh, a couple weeks ago, and basically he said, China and Germany are toast. Don't worry about them. Well, Germany's got uh, hugely invested. That, you know, they're just, he just, he said, they're toast. Um, so not only sort of energy, energy, petroleum products for energy, but fully half of German industry depends on petroleum products to make plastics, chemicals, dyes, fertilizer, what have you. They're just fucked because they they will they will never be able to source enough enough raw materials to make that happen. And there's a bunch of other dynamics I don't remember him talking about, but I was shocked. He was like, Germany is just toast. In 10 years, Germany is not a player. Like like they're they're broken. Uh, and then China has problems too big to overcome. He was same sort of thing. I have a hard time with that Germany argument because I I, I know I already know of several um, research projects around. Um, Resourcing put uh, hydrocarbons uh, out of plastics, basically recycling plastics into hydrocarbons at very low cost. Uh -huh. And so, the I, I don't see. I find it very difficult to to fully accept any argument that a loss of a core a particular resource will, in and of itself, mean the collapse of a fairly um, well established economic power. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. agree with me. I think the, the Germans are auto, automobiles, machine tools. I mean, the, it's very odd about uh, Germany is if you look at them, these are the things they got good at in the early 20th century. And yeah. it's so odd to look at the Germans and realize their economy, they're still doing the same thing they did then. It's very fascinating. So here are some of the assertions he made in this talk. I just pressed, I just pasted the YouTube link to this talk. This is the talk that I watched. It's based on his book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization. <clears throat> um, and, um, and one of the things he says is that China is no longer the low-cost producer of anything. Many plots right. wage rates, which have climbed out of the cellar. <laughs> China, no China, China, into Vietnam and everything. And it'll well, soon be Africa. Yes, yeah, India. But, the, but the problem is that nothing is making its way to China to be made. So, I mean, uh, think about it. Korea and Japan used to be low-cost producers. 
God, okay. yeah. I, I remember as a kid the whole made in Japan thing. Yeah. So I, I nope, I think um, out of that. So you're not buying. Nope. That's good. Um, but I like that he sort of puts out a lot of logic and a lot of evidence and makes a, 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 a an out there claim. I, I appreciate people who sort of try to build a case like that. It is good. Um, did you guys totally left field? Have you guys seen uh, the Peripheral on Amazon Prime? Yeah. Oh, I love that show. That is one yeah. of the best written, best imagined, and executed I have seen in like several years. I, I, I am Amazon's quality is kind of like this. Yeah. But I was like, holy shit! That was really that was cool. really really amazing. And I don't. It's based on a science fiction novel, right? And Bill I, Gibson. William yeah. Gibson, the peripheral, yeah. But but the fascinating part is is like it's set ten years in the future, and then it's set, um, I guess uh, 2020, 20, 2200 in the UK. Um, but just ah. like ten years into the future, where you know everything is printed, there's really no logistical transports anymore. You just print what you need at a local print factory. Even pharmaceuticals are printed. Um, and this notion of quantum tunneling can connect the future to a host in our day, and all you're transferring is knowledge, and it can become a two-way pipe to connect consciousnesses. I was like, okay, that's okay. This is this is a kind of time travel I can get behind. This this one I'm I'm kind of leaning into. This is very very interesting. Time travel, you could love. Yeah. But they talk about the jackpot, which is the demise of everything. That's what I wanted you to get to, and I want to hear you and Jamey talk about that. Ah. <laughs> well, I, I haven't seen the show, but I read the book when it came out four or five years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, and he never goes, well, in the book at least, they never never goes into any real detail as to what the jackpot meant, you know, what it actually you know, was composed of. Yeah. And I don't know if they do that in any more detail in the show. They they have a scene where they go to a graveyard in modern day London, and it's kind of like a museum. And it talks about at this date, this happened, this date, this happened, this date, this happened. And it was a sequence of cascading events. But, you know, on there was, you know, uh, the the ecology of collapse, you know, collapsing um, and um, the release of uh, things out of the permafrost that you know cause mm -hmm. harm to humans, um, and then uh, all you know, nuclear war was in there, and you know, population control and famine were in there. But there was a there's a moment in time where this the sequence of events that are all kind of interconnected. Once they start, you can't stop it, and so. Uh, the Scientific Institute of the Future was trying to send people in the past to try to understand this and manipulate it somehow. And every time they sent somebody in the past, it would create a stub in the timeline. And so the history as London understood it is now different based upon what they've triggered in the past. Um, so that's kind of interesting as well. Hmm. But uh, but yeah, when they started to preview all the events in the uh, in the jackpot, I was like, oh, check, check, check. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, uh... I, I threw the name or, or the the guns of August, you know, the Barbara Tuckman history yeah. piece from decades ago, but just about the um, the inevitability, uh, the um, or the momentum of uh, World War One. Right. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem with World War One, hey Kevin, um, part of the problem with World War One is that everybody had all these. There, there were the Triple Entente and the you know all those kinds of things. Everybody was in these treaties that that committed them to do stuff, and then everybody had orders like written and ready to ready to fire. And the moment somebody triggered orders, those orders unfolded all the way down to troop movements into the field, so that your army basically materialized in the field. And if it didn't materialize opposite the other the opposing army at the same moment, you were done. You were overrun. So. So basically, both sides once committed had to commit uh, into <clears throat> battle to show up facing each other, and then it was just like horrifying. Wow! That, yeah, that, you remember a lot from the thesis of that book, Jerry. Bravo! Um, this is from other stuff, other sources post that, not necessarily Guns of War, but um, yeah. Another another little thing from Guns of War was that Russia intentionally built its rails on a different gauge from Germany because they didn't want Germany to just be able to roll their stock onto Russia and overrun the country you have to admire that right you there do. 
I will admire that. <clears throat> and, and April and I took a train from uh, West Beijing train station up to Ulaanbaatar once, where at 10 p.m. there's a gauge change. And they take the whole train, let's call it a dozen cars. Uh, they let passengers get off if they want to, but we stayed on. Uh, they then roll the whole train into a huge shed, separate the cars, jack the cars up tall enough that humans can walk under them, roll new bogies. Basically, they, they have a... a the, they, the, the other gauge bogies get rolled under and push it, push the, the previous gauge bogies out. Uh, and then they drop the cars, settle them back in, reassemble the train, go back to the station, load the passengers, and go again. The whole operation takes like an hour and a half. And there's probably a hundred people on the floor, like managing it, doing all that at, at 10 p.m. And they do that each direction for this train. Same thing happens between Switzerland and Italy. It's kind of a I cool the, thing to watch. Janice and I took the train from Paris, overnight train from Paris to Berlin in 92. So shortly after the wall fell. And they didn't do, they didn't allow us to stay in, in the train for the midnight shift of gauge. But they had that same kind of experience of we have to completely leave the train and let them do change yeah. everything in order to get back into the same car, but on a completely different rail. Mm -hmm. I think that's, this is my video from that bogey swap. I think uh, I'm gonna, I think that's that's actually my video from the bogey swap. Hmm. So did, did, maybe, cool. did you post the guns of August because you think we're rolling into that right now? Well, no, just the, the description of the jackpot of uh, the. Yeah. Once the catalyst hit, everything fell inevitably. Uh, it followed along inevitably. Just reminded me of that, you know, the Guns of August type argument around World War One. Just a stream of consciousness thing. But we're also nowhere near as tightly coupled as that world. In terms of um, military in ter in, strategy, in no. terms of in terms of tactics, strategies, tools, weapons, all that kind of stuff. So I'm interested in what the jackpot implies for where the tight constraints are that are inevitable once the ball starts rolling, because it sounds like a technological change. Uh, it, well, there was global warming, which triggered a ton of ecological events, right? And so suddenly the breadbaskets of the world couldn't produce. Yep. And so that triggered fam, fam, famine. The collapse of key species, pollinators, which eat, you know adds to it. So there's those two things in concert with each other. Uh, there's political unrest. There's the release of new viruses from the permafrost, which decimated mankind. And so the isolation of humans with the lack of scarce resources collapsed government systems and corporate systems. And then it turned into fractions. Um, you know, one of the things that is in the rear view mirror. So in, in this narrative, right, from this year out 10 years, Texas uh, attempts to separate from the United States. And so Homeland Security becomes a defense system to go to war against Texas to stop the segregation of Texas. Wow. And so that's a big event that happens just in the next 10 years. And that creates, from what I can sense, an overall, you know, a demise of America and its economy for most parts. With so I have, I, whole homeland security looking over everyone. Right. So I have two different pathways out of, out of that. Um, uh, one, is that I just did a, uh, earlier this year, I did a project on the future of California with the state of California and IFTF. You may remember me talking about that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was part of the internal debate with the, the people from the state uh, was whether or not we should have um, attempts at secession. Yeah. And whether it was from Texas or California. Mm -hmm. And there was, it was really interesting how at first they were very interested in pursuing that line of discussion. And then suddenly, like it was very, it was almost as if something came down from above said, we we will not have we will not entertain that possibility for any of the scenarios, no matter how dire, no matter how wonderful. Wow. So that's so that's one line. And mm -hmm. suddenly I'm blanking on what the other one was, but it was brilliant. Ooh, um, think about it. Well, I'll <laughs> talk for a minute, Jamey, and then you talk. Um, so realize that the US is what, you know, it's the EU, it, it, the a combined market where you can cross borders and do stuff is in, amazingly efficient and wealth creating for us and that is not something i mean we may you may <laughs> consider it but believe me it look what's happening anyways so that is a benefit that eh, 
and militarily too. I mean, that's one thing when I visit my mother's country, Iceland, and you go there and you realize oh, this little country of 350,000 people has to have a uh, diplomatic service. It has to, I mean, when you add up if of the states separated, how many, how much overlapping state departments, militaries, I mean, you know, regulatory commissions. I mean, it, oh, okay, is that enough yeah. to make? No, it's a big, yeah. big cost, yeah. Um, the, the the other thing I was going to say was, was that with regards to what Jerry was saying um, around how tightly coupled things are, I think we just we in the last couple of years saw an example of what happens with a cascading failure with the pandemic, ah. and particularly around supply chains. Oh yeah, um, and you know and the prices that uh, for components and the availability of, of uh, key materials and key industries. You know, it was actually. A very much an example of you start one thing and it just cascades from there. Yeah. I mean, we study, um, I'm, I'm late to the conversation, but you've hit on something that we study called uh, customer company coherence. And what it is, it's, it's studying dyadic relationships from the value chain starting at the raw materials to components to what the company does to add value, ultimately delivering it to people. And our, uh, you know, object lesson to start is Takata airbags. Mm. So we say, look, okay, the Japanese auto industry is very committed to Kaizen and Kanban and total quality management. But yet, right, there was a supplier over here that didn't share that value system, right? And they supplied a component, which is supposed to be safety related, that actually hurt people when it was deployed, you know, would send shrapnel into the passenger compartment. And it's uh, a it's an example of you can have shared interests like the State Department talks about, but to be coherent, you have to have shared values. And so, you know, going across each of those relationships, right, you need to be able to understand what's going on. I think that one of the reasons you may, I would infer that they say, oh, you know, we're not going to consider this is once you decouple, right, you realize what you're not in relationship with anymore. Right. Right. Same, and same you say, oh, you, you, you think that, you know, the, the UK had difficulty pulling out of, you know, the European Union, uh, you know, uh -huh. a state decoupling from the United States and all of the benefits that are associated you know let's start over there's no interstate commercial you know right. uh ACC. law all right system anymore you're all louisiana oops and there's, and there's, <laughs> tariffs, and there's tariffs across every state <laughs> border blah 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 oh my god you know, there's all the federal land and you know california particularly would be a mess in terms of who who controls all the military bases right and the you know, mm -hmm. Air Force Base and things, stuff like that. So taken, who ha who has nuclear weapons and who doesn't? <laughs> they, would all, they would all simply be taken over and California would become the largest armed country in the world. But I, would, I will say this, by the way, I think reshoring of supply chains, that is the next decade. Um, it's not going to be like all back to America, but it's it also will be Mexico. Will It'll be, I'm talking mm -hmm. about the United States, uh, mm -hmm. Vietnam, uh, Korea, you know, that that's going to happen. Um, so a couple of a couple of data points on that from from Apple. Apple is moving a, a good chunk of its iPhone production to India, and is talking about doing uh, its next generation uh, silicon production in Arizona. Good, mm -hmm. good job. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it's uh, and it's surprising that they're not considering Mexico, you know, for some of their, you know, assembly as opposed to India. But you know they're looking at a global landscape and mm -hmm. you know a, a labor market, and at the same time they probably want you know people in India to favor you oh, know exactly, Apple exactly right. as but, a uh, you know please it, it's yeah. it's made right here you no, guys that's a, that you is billion a, should buy this thing all right the, the Indians <laughs> are very uh, protective of their market and uh, most uh, m much of the time when you go there they basically force you to partner with somebody. I had uh, to do that uh, in uh, South Korea. Right. So this is a th that is a great political decision by Apple. Yeah, I mean, once they're in there and they're employing a bunch of Indian people, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's like, hey, <laughs> for us, we sell iPhones here. Wow, you're one of the biggest markets in the world, and you're growing. So that's a great decision. Boy, they yeah. must have some some very smart political people there who uh, have educations like uh, 
or, or <laughs> like us, you know, you know so people like us. Well, I mean, look at all of the, you know, companies that are already embedded that we get a lot of services from, you know, the Tatas and the Infosys and all those companies, you know, they were probably advising, hey, we've got a supply chain here that could support this, right? Mm -hmm. Come on over. We should invent sci-fi roulette, which is an online game you can play that that <laughs> where you spin the big wheel and it's got all these dystopian plots, you know, from Ministry for the Future to the peripheral to uh, Ready Player One to what have you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, okay, the, these three are the ones that are coming true right now. Yeah, I just finished Neil Stevenson's Termination Shock from published last year. <clears throat> I haven't read that yet. Is that, um, does it talk about geoengineering? Yeah, okay. That's yeah, the that's the main premise. Yeah, because termination shock is a term from geoengineering. All right. Yeah, hundred hundred percent. You know, once you start, right, you shouldn't stop <laughs> unless you pulled out the carbon. And yeah, that, I know that. Yeah, actually, oh, this reminds oh, me. Oh, you I pulled the carbon out from underneath me. That's says the oil I'm, not, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not familiar with the concept, Kevin. Tell, please explain. No, no, R read it. I don't you want to geoengineer, geoengineering or, ter or um, termination shock. Termination shock. Oh, it, it's just, you know, the, the basically, if once you, what geoengineering does is puts a um, artificial suppression of temperature uh, in either in the stratosphere or in orbit or something, uh, something to hold, you know, to hold down temperatures, even as carbon increases in the atmosphere. But if that is suddenly stopped or even, you know, or swiftly stopped, the the accumulated the continued accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere means that once it stops, the temperature spikes, and actually, for various geophys geophysical reasons, spikes up above where it would would have been had you just continued, you know, to let the planet warm. But you know, the same thing would work in terms of foreign aid, right? I mean, the the economics of that is that you're supplying, you're supplying it, all right, and all of a sudden it's withdrawn the effects to that economy, the termination shock, you know, creates a situation that was far worse than when you started because they became dependent on your aid. So you created a new equilibri equilibrium. So it was termination shock can work across a number of different right. dimensions. Right. Oh, thanks guys. Oh, by the way, um, Brazil, uh, hey, good things happen in Brazil. Let's celebrate a win, gentlemen. <laughs> Are you um, talking I, about in soccer or are you talking about in the talking, political realm? Lula being reelected, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. All right, Janae, what's the what's the concern? Uh, it, it it looked at first like Bolsonaro's supporters had been basically been deflated, and that's looking like may not be quite so true. Right. That there You're is busy. some reassembly of forces uh, and um, discussion of of action. So I'm not, while I think it's likely that Lula will actually uh, ascend to the actual presidency and that will continue with some stability, it is less likely than I would like, mm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. ooh, ooh. Oh, boy. Well, I might uh, Brad, you're muted. Doing well, huh? Don't get, if you, hey, Jamey, if something is, uh, if something's <laughs> going wrong, make sure you email me so I can get the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah, it's like you dibby down. Speaking of elections, were we surprised by November? Here yeah. the good news. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was very pleasantly surprised by uh, Colorado, whatever it was, where Bobert came within 500 votes of losing her seat. Mm -hmm. yep. Not close enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and Georgia, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, anyone, anyone else but Walker probably would have won. Any, you know, any re relatively mm -hmm. normal Republican probably would have won handily. Which sucks. I mean, I mean, the fact that that election was one percentage point or one and a half percentage point spread with a moron like Herschel like running is like, okay, so people were just voting party and holding their nose mm -hmm. about person. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's team. Yeah, there, there's an R by the name, so it's he's my guy. Yep. Yeah, there's some general rancor about Kristen Cin Kirsten Cinema, you know, becoming an independent, but she's following the general trend of the electorate. There are people who are departing the Republican Party and the Democratic Party to move toward independent as the better description of who they are. I don't so see that, many Republicans doing this. Like it who is. Else? 
well i'm it, it's i i think i think it i think it just helps her her lobbying capacity well it was very no, I, I know that okay i'm just saying that i yeah. think it's just reflective yeah. of you know larger i think we're going to end up with a lot more independence all right yeah, that yeah seeking a middle that isn't available in either party Keep yeah. going. What, what yeah. pissed me off about cinema is that she ran when she ran in 2018. Uh, she ran as a progressive, mm -hmm. and she was in fact a pretty hardcore progressive. She's open and the first openly bisexual, openly atheist. And I really like she, she got she trounced as a progressive. I'm sorry. She got trounced as a progressive. She won as a progressive. Uh, first when election she, when she, she had, she did not win. Okay, the first election, but when she ran in 2018, she still I she understand, still ran. but yeah. she had to come a little bit more centrist to win that election. All right, she was so far out the first time. Uh, she was, I'm sorry, she wasn't a Democrat. She was a Green Party candidate, and right. she did not win as a Green Party candidate. No, no. Well, how, how often do people win as a Green Party <laughs> candidate at any you know, at any level above you know school board? I know um, that's the, welcome to Chapel Hill. <laughs> the the point is that. Uh, um, I I thought that when she ran, she actually was presenting uh, something that I could really support. And so her moving very quickly into becoming not not so much a conservative, but a corporatist. Yeah, yeah. that's it. That's it. Um, yeah, really, really bothered me, really pissed me off. I think um, it's interesting that she kept her going independent until after Georgia had settled. Because that that would have been a crisis in the Democratic Party before mm -hmm. that. Now it sort of takes the Democrats back to where they were, sort of ish, and it's kind of truth in advertising for her and Manchin's kind of position in the Senate anyway. Well, Manchin is about as good as you can get as a Democrat for West Virginia right now. Right. I, mean, I, I I may not like Manchin, but I understand his his point of view. Yeah. Um, cinema. Cinema. Cinema or her advisors, you know, together they're smart. She's smart because moving to, if she ran as a Democrat, she would have lost in a mm -hmm. primary. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody likes her. You said fifty-seven percent dislike her in Republicans, fifty-five in Re Democrats, fifty-one among um, Independents. You know, uh, uh, she has, she's in the negatives or every every political category yep. mm -hmm. in Arizona. But if she ran as a Democrat, she would have lost in the primary. By moving as an Independent, she knows, and her advisors know that. If they put a Democrat, a reasonable Democrat up against her, then the Republican will win. They'll split the vote, Republican will win. Mm -hmm. So this way she basically has the Democrats over a barrel, not just because of Senate numbers, but because this way she knows that uh, if they behave the way they would have had she remained in the party, you know, they're gonna lose that seat. Well, the thing, the thing that I'm hopeful about is if she caucuses with them mm -hmm. then the democrats have committee control in the senate and right. far more things are now possible than they were locked in this weirdness all yeah. the last few years yeah, yeah. yeah so north carolina the, has proven that you know you can purge because we, we we just had the departure uh you know uh scenarios and uh uh afterburn you know videos of Mad madison cawthorn mm -hmm. all right and how he basically soiled his own nest all right <laughs> he's well he's from where my parents retired you know when they were alive he's from hendersonville north carolina out of oh, the western part of the state wow. and um you know he, he started off you know having a pretty good career but you know he basically he pissed everybody else including the party he was part of right? yeah, yeah. So yep. embarrass kind of them like, wow. over again. <laughs> so anyway um so the it, things are possible I, I i just came out of the election saying things are possible right <laughs> and you know yeah. you shouldn't you know just and and the and the part of my business, you know, the the stuff that reply requires stated preference experiments for people to tell you what they're going to do, mm -hmm. is that profession is still on, you know, the ropes, guys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't get a good sample. All right, I've created new methodologies that don't require sampling. All right, that require, you know, knowing what you're going to measure across a known set of constituencies. All right, and getting rid of the sampling because it's 
it's terrible right now. Uh, so I'll yeah, just, so you just need to introduce GPT-3 and uh, we'll have a complete circle of the that's conversation. It, that's it, exactly. Totally yeah. works. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, the, the parties are acting recursively too. Yeah. Right. Well, no, I meant in terms of this actual this meeting that you were here at the beginning, we talked about AI and GPT-3 and uh, stable diffusion yeah. and all right. that. Running a workshop about this in two hours. <laughs> nice. I had a conversation. So do you have any particular insights for us? Um, having, you know, hosted a few meetings about this and, and done a little bit of work. First is this has been happening for a long time. It's kind of a fractal emergence of a pattern that just broke through at the beginning of the month because the, you know, the pushover event, the tipping point was chat GPT and, you know, not, not being able to, I mean, not having to frame it in a particular way. And so it has entered consciousness, right? That this stuff is possible. So that's mm -hmm. point one. Um, you know, point two is that, it's it's all a mashup, right? Whenever you write this stuff, yeah, well, you know, uh, write a you know a, a thesis about that and and rhyme it like M and M or some you know some. Right. Well, you have to know how M and M does music in the first place, all right? M and M has to create his you know pattern for you know the system to imitate. Well, mm -hmm. you know, guess what? Uh, these systems are not capable of actual creativity yet, right? Um, I'll, I know I I have this fight with um, Kyle Shannon all the time, all right? And it's good; it's a good, healthy you know you know relationship. But um, you know, it can work with the archetypes to create something different. But if you create something new, that's as well. I'm still bending on the humans, all right? To be able to curate and ask better questions. So, You've got to ask a better question or frame a better creative brief or any of this stuff to act, you know, in a way. That's and you're, such a great you're observation. Trying to change your job, Kevin. Go ahead, Brad. Sorry. Yeah, well, that's what I that's what I do for a living is I force I people to ask better questions. And Brad, you know, the tool set will not help you if you're incapable of asking the right questions of the system. And so there's a lot of training that has to be done to upgrade the human's capability of I'm working with elites all over the place. They're very capable, but that is not representative of the general, you know, humanity. All right. Um, so we can have, you know, those are some top line observations. Um, you know, the, the parlor trick demos that are coming through right now, um, they're interesting. And I think that they're going to be creating a lot of first drafts of things that you will then act on and make better and then stitch together and curate. And that's why programming is probably on the way out, but system architecture is coming way in. Okay. So I'll stop. Well, I'm I'm relieved, A, that when I ask it what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything, it gives me 42. So that's very reassuring. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> but but my it's big red Douglas Adams. Good. That's friend. right. That's right. Yeah. But my my big bets, my big bets with my my three daughters, um, 12, 12 and 14 was to they they made it into Orange County School of the Arts. So I thought a creative arts career mm -hmm. was fairly insulated from technological displacement. And now I'm wondering if I placed my bets on the wrong wrong roulette. Somebody asked me, you know, that, you know, the teachers are getting stressed because students are turning in you know, papers now that are written in these, you know, with these systems, right? Yeah. And I said, the first thing to find out is it's grammatically correct and all the words are spelled correctly. It's suspect. Okay. That's a fail. Yeah. Um, right. Number two is you have to import. I'm going to step, I'm going to step off. I just explained in the chat, but uh, I'm passing the con. So you guys keep going until whenever you want to. And uh, okay. Okay. thank you. Sorry to, sorry to bug up. <laughs> yeah. Is you import you know, what you would have in a ma uh, master's or doctoral dissertation, teacher, feed in the paper the student wrote, generate 10 questions based on what the student wrote, and then ask them, right, those questions. Uh -huh. Because if they didn't write the paper, they won't know the answers, right, because they didn't actually absorb the information. They just did the cheat. So 
make them defend their paper, <laughs> right? And you say, well, stuff. that's too much work. Well, guess what? If if there are thirty you know, papers, you can feed them in, and you can get thirty you know individualized tests really fast. Right. And that's... you'll pick some people out in the class and say, hey, Brad, you yeah. wrote that paper about Keep you know the growing. Renaissance. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you a question about your paper. Right. <laughs> right. I love it. I love it. So anyway, I there are ways to hack even that stuff if you just think about it for half a second. You see, the, the larger question for me around uh, the, the creativity element mm -hmm. is to what degree is human, human creativity derivative? You know, if I see further than others because I stand on the shoulder of giants, well, mm -hmm. how much of the stuff that I create comes from a lifetime of having absorbed other people's creations? Mm -hmm. And if if my creation come if my creativity in writing or art or whatever comes from having absorbed a particular set of inputs, how does that differ fundamentally from what the AI is doing? Right. Well, it's because your inputs are mm -hmm. different than Bo's inputs, than my inputs or Brad's inputs. Okay. You have a unique experience and a, and a unique data set that gives you a perspective that no one else on the planet owns. Okay. Right. So that's so, my first reaction. All right. The second is that in the GPT models, you can, I think it's useful to not use it full strength with everything it's learned. It has different, it's trained on this. It's trained on this. It's trained on this. It's interesting to ask the same question and use different training sets to get different derivative responses mm -hmm. and see what that yields. And then you bring yourself to the table and say, what do I want to use out of that for the problem or I've, the task at hand? Yeah, I've played it. You know, if, if you if you spin up a session and you ask five or six questions, now it's now it's on a particular vein of thinking and it can get very insightful in that. And mm -hmm. so what I've done is I've gone down five or six questions and then hit refreshed. So I start new, ask the same set of questions. I get different responses. Because that that momentum of that narrative isn't being carried forward, and it's having to create a new narrative from wherever I was. But and um, it's likely to respond differently over a period of days because it's gone through a lot more training with a lot more people, and it has sure. you know, more insights about what's right and what's wrong as you vote up or down on. You know, did you give me something that was useful? No, nah, that's a bunch of crap. What we did one yesterday, where the, it was you know, give me some inputs. And the, the uh, it wrote a little paper about business metaphysic, business metaphysics because that was the topic I gave it, and bullshit detection, right, as the thing that was necessary to come into existence. And so it went and found a whole bunch of stuff, and I said, you know, some of that's what I, you know, counsel, you know, businesses about, mm -hmm. um, and other parts of it was was just superfluous BS itself. Yeah. Right. Um, but ground of being in reality is an interesting thing to try to take a C-suite through, through and say, are you actually questioning all the assumptions about how you're running the joint? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I have more experience with the visual art AI than with the GPT series. So the know, some, of my, some of my opinion comes from, from that. But what, as you were speaking you know, and thinking, you know, reflecting on mm -hmm. the idea that, you know, my creativity comes from my personal experiential history completely mm -hmm. yeah, right there um imagine there therefore imagine an ai a creative ai whether visual arts or or gpt style that you basically give it a a history model history paradigm that is you know write this from the perspective of, you know, for, with the experience base of someone who grew up poor, with the experience base of someone who grew up in London. So yeah. not so much that you're get, telling them to write in a particular style, but to narrow their data sources. I, it's not something you can do right now, but I imagine that, that would be a really interesting way to trigger a particular style of creativity or arena of creativity that comes, that does come from, a simulated experiential history. Yeah, well, I mean, we have animated personas right now that are based on, you know, 
reading the books, reading the literature, reading the papers, whatever of, of a person and having a simulation of how they've written and how they've thought and what they might be interested in, right? And so you could have a Jame companion sitting over here that is expressing your interest and in searching the somatic web and anything that it can get past the firewall on and bring you things that it believes, you know, will be useful for what you do, right? Um, right. It, it, and curate that because honestly, you're a real smart guy, but you cannot absorb all the information, everything that you would possibly be interested in on a daily basis. So if right. you had a little summary that came, hey, Jimmy, are you interested in these things, all right? As a virtual assistant, that'd be pretty cool, right? What you would not want to do is end up being, again, recursive because it would only be bringing things that you used to be interested in. Right. You, would have to, you would have to help it saying, oh, I'm following this now, right? So um, more of this and less of that or whatever, right? Just like right. you would tell a human assistant. <laughs> No, I do. I do think we're absolutely on the verge of that, where I might have seven or eight digital avatars or agents deployed pursuing this topic or that topic and just feeding me back deep learnings and insights to problems. Because yeah, I have those people. Cognitive slaughterbox. There you go. Cognitive slaughterbox. Yeah. Yep. So I have color photographs on the Content Evolution website for you know, the human advisors that are still alive, you know, flesh and blood and the black and white photographs, Buckminster Fuller, uh, you know, uh, Paul Rand, uh, mm -hmm. Richard Sapper, they're dead. All right. But there's a body of knowledge that's left behind. And so they're an animated persona of those people. You can click on it and see what they're interested in today. Um, it, that That's a little bit of a parlor trick because um, is is that really informing me every day no it's really the deep culture of what they brought into existence that informs me i see Would so it's kind of like how did you know buckminster bucky fuller think about systems and you know that deeply informs me about how i see complex you know adaptive systems um blah 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 so Go, would you want a, a simulated version a virtual version of you taking over your company after you're gone um I do want um, a uh, digital inheritance available both to my company and to my heirs. Mm -hmm. I would li li like them to not only get the money or the assets, I'd like to get them to have some of the insights and ideas that I've you know, brought into existence or have run into so that they don't have to self-discover them right? There's a little rich dad, poor dad thing going on here, right? Is, you know, don't just, you know, teach somebody how to get a job, tell somebody how to create something that is a job giving organization. Um, it's a different perspective, right? right? So generally, generationally, I'd like to be able to pass that down. And again, we're doing a um, silver tsunami with a company right now, where there's a key exec executive who is planning to retire and they want him modeled. They said, you know, he does some phenomenal operations things here that nobody else knows how to do. Mm -hmm. So let's study him. Let's embody that into a knowledge base and let's make that available for people after he goes. That's amazing. So, I mean, so, uh, you know, you talk okay. about a regretted loss. Everybody who, you know, would be categorized as a regretted loss for an organization should be considered and consulted about whether they would be willing to uh, be part of this. At some point, we're going to build it into the employment contract at the beginning that yeah. says you're going to be forced to do that. <clears throat> right now, it's a, you know. It, it's an opt-in as opposed to you must, right? And the and reason I, that it becomes a, you know, uh, you must is that everything that you do will be observed and categorized during your employment, right? And it becomes a model of how you behaved. I'll stop. So if I were to, to leave the, comp <laughs> leave the company be, you know, prior to retirement, 
if I were to get a job with somebody else, mm -hmm. would my virtual version remain with com the first company? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I think that, that's a negotiation topic. Yeah. Well, for one thing is if you did work for a company, let's, you know, let's take this example. One of my neighbors recently died, Fred Brooks. You know, Fred, you know, he invented the IBM 360 computer. He was the okay. first com large commercial computer. And then he, you know, uh, was, you know, created the Brooks Center at the UNC for computing, right? So he was a professor and, you know, taught it for a long time. Uh, Fred left IBM. Was there a long legacy of stuff, right, that was Fred Brooks-like, you know, mythical man month kind of thinking after Fred left? You bet there was a large residue of Fred Brooks left at IBM. He wasn't there anymore. Did we extract stuff out of his DNA and embed it in the company? No, but, you know, he still looms large over how the business operates, mm -hmm. right? So I think that whether you do it intentionally or not, there are people, you know, the accumulated wisdom of why the organization behaves the way, way it does and its, or, uh, its you know, culture, culture, culture is inertia. It's knowledge inertia. Okay, so let me, let me flip the question around. If I okay. have a, if I have an, a, um, an especially good simulation, mm -hmm. emulation mm -hmm. of you, why do I keep you around? Why don't I just fire you and hang on to your emulation? It'd be cheaper that way. Well, it, it presupposes that the frozen version is the one that you want as opposed to the emergent version. Right. It, yeah, it's it's a new versus known phenomenon as well. Part of part of anytime you're encountering something new, that intellect is going to problem solve it, and the way it's going to problem solve it in this particular instance probably is ninety five percent similar to how they problem solved two weeks ago. But that five percent of net net new, that's what you're going to be missing. So you know, if you had harvested Kevin, you know, version one, decade one at IBM, you would have gotten the PR guy. Yeah. If you harvested Kevin, you know, version two, decade two, you would have gotten Red Adair, all right? The point him at a problem. Where's the fire? Okay. Uh, decade three, um, uh, leading to retirement. Design thinking, solving large scale system problems for the company and creating new sources of revenue, right? Which one did you want to harvest? Yeah. Well, you, har you harvest the... <laughs> basically becomes a balancing game if you harvest the the um oldest one that you willingly will still pay for so basically as as long as you are continuing to make us the money that we want more so than we can just get out of you out of your simulation we'll keep you but the moment you become you know, basically a red line in our balance books and we okay. keep your, we can keep your simulation around and get so get ninety percent of your value uh, in so, perpetuity without having to pay pay uh, health insurance. Yeah, I mean, Procter and Gamble created something called Your Encore when I was looking at uh, studying alumni relations for the chairman's office. And what they said, you know, for regretted lost people is when you're retiring or when you're leaving the business, right, and you're not going to a competitor, you know, can we have you under contract? So if we need something from you. You know, there's a set of known terms and conditions and remuneration so mm -hmm. that we can pick up the phone and say, hey, can you come back in and do a couple of months of work for us? All right. Yeah. Would you like to do that? And you're kind of ready to go. All right. For these personas or these, you know, um, embodiment of expertise, maybe the deal is if you'll do that, all right, at whatever point, all right, uh, and we use it, we're going to pay for it. It's like you're still here, right? That, you know, we're going to give you a trickle charge off of, you know, we're going to give you more than your pension because we're still using your knowledge and expertise and we're paying it. So we're paying you. It's a subscription plan. Subscribe to Jermaine. Yeah. And, and so you say, you know, even I'm happy you will for become you a, a rentier, Bo. Even yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. And, and maybe as the thing changes, that like royalties, on an old song, maybe they change, maybe it's mm -hmm. less valuable. So, you know, my my check goes down over years because the expertise is worthless. I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of ways you can engineer it to get people right. to opt in, but you know, why not? 
Yeah, well, it's like uh, like Brett said, it's a it's subject to negotiation. Hundred percent. And think, I wonder yeah. if it becomes something that get how I wonder how soon it will be that unions pick up on this. Ooh. Well, guess what? Uh, I have told unions. This is perverse, okay? But I've told them behind closed doors. I said, let's get all the technologies that could potentially replace your workers and make sure that you have an investment in those companies. Because yeah. if it puts your people out of work, but that's their pension is whatever it is that's going to put them out of business, you should be you know, dealing in the upside to make them wealthy, mm. right? And they kind of look at me like, are you kidding me? And I said, look, you should be investing in robotics automation <laughs> longshoremen, right? Because th they're going to start to pick off your jobs. Now, do you want your people to be well off? You could just do the market basket of just general dynamics of the economy, or you could be, you know, because you've got line of sight. That's, you can see it. You can see what's right. about to happen, you know. So go buy some Fanuc stock. <laughs> yeah. Right? And it's it's like help guide what that transition is going to look like because you're a shareholder now. Right. So anyway, I, it's, it's hard. That's a hard sell. <laughs> you know, what's interesting what you're doing there is the, that like you're addressing their market risk and their market risk is their income from their job. And you're essentially countering that you're I'm de-risking yeah, exactly. the future. That's what I'm saying. From a, yeah. a perspective that would even make, that would make sense. But it's kind of like, freaking automation the problem is it's like hey so, so when you brought up so when you brought up unions i thought it was interesting because my head went immediately to um <laughs> the chat gpt union and protecting its ip and driving subscription revenue to continue to feed the server farms needed to allow it to grow well and i mean how right far away now, are we from that you know since it's free yeah. Now, who's the customer? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're, we're, you're, the veal cutlet. you're the veal cutlet being offered up to who yeah, knows. We're the veal we're. cutlet being offered to GPT-3 because we're training it, right? right? So yeah, at some point that'll flip, right? For sure. And if you have code that was written by GPT-3 embedded in your product, do they own a piece of your company? Right. Because you know the intellectual property actually you know came from there. It's a red hat. It's a red. It's similar to Red Hat, and you know. I don't it, know. Yeah, I, I mean, GPT is not an is not open source. If, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it it can it, it's 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 under a company called OpenAI that started Which is, a commercial right, division right. that is now private. So it started as a five hundred one c three or four, <laughs> but now it's it's got a for profit arm. And clearly, they want to monetize this thing, right? right? It, it's uh, so there are a variety of these different different models. Some of them are open source. So the stable diffusion art source is open source, uh, unlike the one in Midjourney, for example. Yeah. Um, GPT GPT it comes from OpenAI. Um, there's another one, another of the art versions that comes from OpenAI as well. These are not open source. So it becomes a it. There is a definite question as if the if I have GPT code, if I use GPT to to add code to my system, right? Who owns that? Yeah. Well, actually, the the brand OpenAI now is a is false advertising. Yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I mean, it's transmitting one thing about being open and it actually is not. Okay. In fact, it, it's not connected to the web, so it's purposefully disabled to only give you certain kinds of pre-trained responses, mm -hmm. um, which the stuff that I work with in machine learning is looking at the World Wide Web every day, every 24 hours, and learning from that inside those personas and, and those other areas of interest. And it was trained on the Dewey Decimal System. It was given zero to 999 as the classification and it's created another 8,000, you know, different, you know, separate digital fingerprints of its own in terms of classification areas. So hmm. anyway, I've got to go. This okay. was fun. This was uh, fun. Thanks, and guys. I hope you guys have a you. great you know, season. I'll talk to you in 2023. Sounds like right. next year. Thank you guys. Cheers. Cheers. Ciao. Bye.